everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're bringing you the how to play video for the expansion of Zaya Legends of a Drift System. The expansion is called Zaya Embers of a Forsaken Star. Now this expansion in my mind is an essential expansion. And there's not many expansions out there that I truly believe you must own if you, uh, you know, have the base game of a game. But this one, uh, I believe the only other one that maybe I feel that way about is the expansion for Lords of Waterdeep. Um, so that one and this one, essential, exp essential expansions if you own the base game. So I'm, I'm very excited to teach you how to play this. This expansion brings so much new to the table, new ships, new sector tiles, uh, uh, ice comets and uh, space station, or a space station, not space stations, a space station, really, really cool. Uh, before we get on the table, if you do think that while you're watching this, this might be a game that you're interested in, be sure to check the description below for a link where you can purchase the game for yourself, as well as uh, different ways you can support the channel if you want to. All right, so let's get right down to the table and I'll teach you how to play Zaya Embers of a Forsaken Star. Now, Zaya Embers of a Forsaken Star is an expansion that's grouped into various elements that can be uh, added individually or all of them can be added together to the base game. If you are just starting out, it might be easier for you to add only one or two elements to the base game. Or if you just are feeling adventurous, going to throw them all in. Personally, I threw them all in from the very beginning and haven't looked back. It's the only way I play. In this video, we'll first go through the recommended adjusted setup for Zaya using this expansion, and then through each of the new elements. But before we get to the setup, let's take a look at some of the rule changes to the base game implemented by this expansion. When taking the draw mission minor action, the player draws the top three cards from the mission deck and places them face down in front of herself without looking at them. She may still take this minor action once per mission point per turn. After the player's turn ends, she may then look at the drawn missions during the other player's turns. She decides which mission to take prior to the start of her next turn. As normal, a player may only take the draw missions action if she has room for at least one mission. However, she may keep as many missions as she has room for. She may discard missions at any time. If the player ship is destroyed while she has drawn face down missions, she discards them without looking at them. The player no longer needs to sell all of her cargo cubes in order to gain a fame point. Instead, she must sell at least two cargo cubes and all the cubes a particular location will buy. So here on Dorvan 5, they buy cyber cubes. So if she were to sell both of these cyber cubes to Dorvan 5, she would gain one fame point. She of course may still sell less than all of the cubes they can take if she wishes. However, she will not gain a fame point in that case. Assassin missions may be completed if the target ship is destroyed for any reason now, not just if the assassin destroys it. So for instance, if the assassin was looking for the swamp rat and the swamp rat moved into this debris field and then rolled a one on the D20 causing it to explode, the assassin would still get credit for completing this mission. When respawning, players no longer lose a turn. Instead, each ship will respawn with an amount of damage equal to the tier. So tier one ships, one damage. Two ships, two damage, and tier three ships, three damage. Finally, the Manchester, Nightshade, and Long Haul abilities have been rebalanced, and their ability cards should be replaced with these included with the expansion. So let's get to the setup. Now much of this will seem familiar to anyone who has played Zaya's base game before, but there are a few noticeable differences. Find the sector tile near and place it face up in the center of the play area. Shuffle the rest of the sector tiles and place them face down in a stack within reach of all players. This white circle with a number inside is called a spawn point. Deal one sector tile per player, placing them face up in the center of the play area adjacent to near, matching up the edge symbols to nears. If a sector tile without a spawn point is drawn, discard it, replace it with a new drawn sector tile, and then shuffle the discarded tile back into the deck. 
on page two of the expansion rulebook, there is a recommended set of patterns for different player counts for the tile setup. This arrangement you see here is for three players. Players are provided a new set of exploration tokens with this expansion. Use only these new exploration tokens when playing the game. Shuffle the relic tokens and exploration tokens into their own piles and place them face down within reach of the players. Place an exploration token face down on any exploration spaces on these starting tiles. Shuffle the mission cards, title cards, and event cards and place them nearby. It should also be noted that all of the new mission cards with the expansion can be shuffled directly into the existing mission deck. Place the cargo cubes, damage, ice damage, outfits, credits, and dice within easy reach of all players. Give each player one new how to win card, which also has a player turn reference on the back, and give each player 4,000 credits. Place the Kiln's NPC card in the play area within view of all players, and its miniature on the rules space of the near sector tile. Randomly deal out these three NPC cards to three different players face up. In a four or five player game, not every player will get one. The players who receive these cards also take the corresponding NPC minis and place them on the NPC cards. Place the new fame point track and the economy board in the play area. Players now decide the number of fame points needed for victory. Place this victory marker on the decided fame point number. While the expansion rulebook does not quote an average playtime based on fame point totals, the base game rulebook does say that the average playtimes are 15 minutes per player for five points, 30 minutes per player for 10 points, and 45 minutes per player for 20 points. Next, determine the number of starting resource cubes for each cube type on the economy board by rolling a d6 for each different type of resource. So let's say we start with the holo resource. It will have one starting resource. And you continue around the board like that. And just like that, you have a randomly set up economy that is flush with some resources, in this case Terra, and much more scarce on other resources such as Cyber and Holo in this case. Separate out all the blue tier one ship mats as well as their matching ability cards. Each player rolls a d20 to determine the first player to choose a tier one ship mat with matching ability card and mini. This continues counterclockwise around the table until each player has chosen. All players then place their minis on the spawn point of the sector tile closest to them. Also, these rings are provided to help better distinguish between each player's ship. Each player now takes an impulse token and places it on their impulse space and a set of six markers. Four of these markers go on the armed space of the ship mat. One goes on the highest number of their energy meter and the final marker goes on the zero unknown space of the fame point track. In the same order as ship selection, each player may now spend her credits to purchase outfits. Players are not required to spend all or any of their credits at this point. The outfits are placed in the ship's hold, and if they do not fit, they may not be placed in the hold at all. The game is now ready to start. The player who picked her ship last takes the first player token and begins the first turn. The new fame point track is similar to the old one, except now it adds pink event spaces that show when to draw event cards. Event cards come out much like titles, but change the game in dynamic and powerful ways. The first player to reach or pass an event space draws an event card during her status phase. She then reads it aloud and resolves any effects. Many events last for a limited number of rounds, such as this one, and this must be tracked. In this case, the card is placed to the right of the first player and any round rules on the card activate immediately prior to the first player's turn. This section is the while this card is in play section. It shows the rules for when this card is in play. Often these rules override normal rules. Then this section is this card leaves play when. This section shows the rules for what will cause this card to leave play. The event tokens included in this expansion can be used to help remember that an event is taking place. For instance, 
Retethered provides rules that override the normal rules for the Tiger Skate, so a player may place this over the rules section of the Tiger Skate to remember that this event is in play. As previously mentioned, be sure to remove the entire set of original exploration tokens and replace them with the new exploration tokens. When the player collects an exploration token, she places it face up on her ship mat and then immediately resolves the token. This token immediately provides the player with up to five additional movement. This token provides the player with the matching cargo cube from the supply and places it in her hold. If she doesn't have space in her hold for the cube, it is placed in her space on the board instead. Keep in mind, these cubes are coming from the supply, not the economy board. This token deals the player one ice damage immediately. However, this is blockable with a shield. This token immediately refills the player's energy meter to full. This token is the captain in need token and has the player draw the top mission card, but only read the deliver to section. The player ignores everything else on the card. The player then transports the captain to the deliver to spot and upon completion earns one fame point and 1000 credits. It's important to note that the Captain in Need mission does take up an active mission slot. Players may discard an existing mission to make room if needed. If the player doesn't wish to accept the Captain in Need mission, she may discard the card but still keeps the Exploration Token. After resolving an Exploration Token, the player keeps it face up on her ship mat. Whenever a player has two Exploration Tokens on her ship mat, and after resolving the one she just collected, she removes both tokens from the game and chooses to either gain one fame point or 2,000 credits. Whenever a player wants to purchase cubes from a buy space, the cubes must come from the economy board. Those cubes are removed and then placed in the player's hold. Alternatively, when a player sells cubes, each cube sold is consumed by that planet and placed into the supply. That planet then produces a new cube of the type the planet generates, taking it from the supply and placing it onto the economy board. So, if the Vagabond sold one Cyber, Dorian 5 would then generate one Terra, which goes onto the economy board. The economy board may never hold more than six cubes of a single type. Players are reminded of what resources a planet produces in two ways. It is the buy space of that planet, and also this arrow shows here what each resource type sold will produce. Loth is a special case, and when a player sells on Loth, no other cubes are generated. If any resource space is empty during a player's status phase, place 1,000 credits on that space. This resource type is now in demand. The next player to generate that resource by way of selling the associated consumed resource receives the 1,000 credit bonus. Each empty resource section may hold a maximum of 1,000 credits. Kai has a special space that allows the player to trade resources. To trade, place any number of cubes in the player's hold on the economy board and then take an equal number of different resource cubes from the economy board. It's important to remember that the type of cubes that are taken must be different types than the types of cubes that were placed. If the player placed cubes that were in demand, such as this holo, she does get the 1000 credit bonus. The kiln is a space station NPC that orbits the star near. Ships can dock with the kiln similar to landing on a planet. A player may dock with the kiln from any space adjacent to it at the cost of one movement. The player places her ship on any space on the NPC card when she docks. Every time a player's ship docks with a kiln, it orbits. The player rolls a d6 and moves the station along its path a number of spaces equal to the roll. The kiln cannot end movement in an occupied space and will instead reduce its movement by one until it ends in an unoccupied space. 
While dot with the station, if the player has a relic token in her hold, she may take the sift action. When the player sifts a token, it is removed from a hold and revealed. At this point, she picks which reward she receives. The white cargo cube ember can be sold at the kiln as well. The white cargo cube ember may be sold on the kiln at a rate of 2,000 credits per cube. Players may earn fame points selling cubes of ember just like normal cubes. Players outside the kiln may not interact with players inside the kiln and vice versa. When two or three ships are inside the kiln, they are all considered adjacent. Once inside the kiln, a player may use movement points just like normal. A player may exit the kiln from any space and then place their ship on any adjacent space outside of the kiln using one movement. The business phase may be conducted on the kiln just like on a regular planet. It's important to remember, however, that while the kiln is considered an NPC, it does not take turns like other NPCs. It cannot be affected, attacked, or damaged by other ships, and in the unlikely event it is destroyed by some event, all ships docked at it are also destroyed. Anytime the kiln is destroyed, it will respawn on the special rule space of Nier. The kiln always respawns at the beginning of the next player's turn and any ships that were on it will respawn using normal ship respawn rules. When a dead world is discovered, place a number of relic tokens specified on this space. A player may excavate using one of these spaces, and each time she successfully excavates, she draws the top tile from the stack and places it in her hold face down without looking at it. If the player does not have two orthogonally adjacent spaces in her hold, then she may not take the excavate action at all. When excavating, the player rolls a d20. On a 1 through 10, she suffers that much ice damage. If, on the other hand, she rolls an 11 through 20, she successfully excavates, drawing a tile from the top, as previously mentioned. When the final relic token is drawn from this stack, the excavation site has collapsed and cannot be used anymore this game, and these spaces become normal spaces. As long as one relic token still remains, however, these spaces are considered normal occupied spaces. Also, as you might expect, there is no business phase on a dead planet. Once a relic token is in a player's hold, it acts very similar to cargo cubes, including that players may jettison them. Also, if a space where the relic token is ever damaged, it is automatically jettisoned. However, jettisoning a relic is different than jettisoning a cargo cube. If it is jettisoned for any reason, it is actually destroyed and removed from the game rather than being placed on the board. As previously mentioned, relic tokens remain face down until sifted. To sift a relic token, the player must dock with the kiln. Then as an action from any space in the kiln, she may sift any relic token in her hold. The player removes the relic token from her hold and flips it face up. The player then chooses to receive either one fame point or the other reward shown. Any rewards that might need to go in the player's hold but wouldn't fit are ignored. Anomaly sectors have very concentrated gravity represented by dashed glowing paths. Some, as you see here, will even have multiple paths. Whenever a player enters a gravity path on any space, she must roll the specified die. The ship then moves along the path the number of spaces rolled. After making the roll for entering the path, if the player's ship is still on the path, she may move along it in either direction or even exit the path without rolling again. Any movement the player had prior to entering the path is retained and may be used upon resolving the roll for entering the path. So, if I had three movement and I used one movement to move onto this path, I now have two movement left. But first, I have to roll this die. I roll a one, I move one space along the path, and now I retain the previous two movement that I still had left. And I can use it to continue along the path if I wish or go anywhere else. Once a player moves off the path, if she re-enters it for any reason, she must roll the die again. If the player rolls high enough to take her completely off the path, her forced movement will stop the moment she exits the path. 
If there were any effects in the space that she was forced to move into, those effects will be applied as if she had moved there willingly. Players may not take any actions, including minor actions, during forced movement along a gravity path. These light blue dashed lines are for comets. Each ice asteroid contains one comet. When the sector is first revealed, place the comet on the special rule space, as you see here. Whenever any player, but not an NPC, moves onto any space on the path of a comet, immediately roll a d6. The comet moves the indicated number of spaces. If the comet were to end its movement on a space with a ship or a cargo cube, that ship or cargo cube is instantly destroyed. The exact same thing occurs if a ship enters the comet space. Once the comet's movement is resolved, if the ship had any remaining movement, it may continue its movement at this point. Also, similar to the gravity paths, the ship may move along the path without triggering the comet any further. Once comet movement has been triggered, players may not take any actions, including minor actions, until the movement is resolved. In the unlikely event that the comet is destroyed, it will respawn on the special rule space at the beginning of the next player's turn. These are ice asteroids. If a player moves into an ice asteroid space, she rolls a d20. On a 1 through 10, she takes that amount of ice damage, which is blockable with shields. On an 11 through 20, nothing happens. Ember is a new type of cargo cube that we've mentioned several times at this point, and it can be found in quarry spaces in certain ice asteroid sectors. To take the quarry action, the player must be on the quarry space and have at least one free space in her hold. She then rolls a d20. On a 1 through 10, she takes that amount of ice damage, which is blockable by shields. On an 11 through 20, she receives one ember cargo cube and places it in her hold. At this point, we've mentioned ice damage several times, so what exactly is it? Ice damage counts as normal damage, with the following exceptions. During a player's business phase, ice damage melts away for free and the player may remove it all. However, during a player's status phase, if she still has ice damage in her ship, she places one ice damage in every space that is orthogonally adjacent to the current ice damage. So as you can see, ice damage tucked away in a corner like this might not be so bad during the first status phase. However, if it's still there for a next status phase, it would move here. The following status phase would look like this, and then this, and then this, until finally it spreads and destroys the entire ship. When freezing, spaces with normal damage should be ignored as ice damage cannot spread through these spaces. There are two new lawful missions and two new outlaw mission types available with the expansion. Private Eye and Cargo are lawful missions, Coerce and Arms Dealer unlawful. Embers introduces two new outfits, Cargo Pods and Armor Plating. For each of these, the green space must be inside the hold, as usual. But the remainder of the outfit sits outside the hold, thereby adding additional spaces to the player's ship. A player may use multiple of these outfits, but they may not overlap like this. All four spaces of the cargo pod may be used for only cargo cubes or relic tokens. If it is used to store a relic token, the entire token must be inside the pod and may not overlap into the ship. Only the space which connects to the ship may be damaged. If it is damaged, all three other spaces are treated as if they are damaged as well, jettisoning any cargo or relic tokens. Each space on the armor plating can hold one damage and only damage. This allows the ship to take on more damage before being destroyed. Ice damage will only spread to and from the armor plating via this green space. Mods are special one by one outfits that provide special abilities. Just like regular outfits, they become unusable if damaged. Mods may be stored in the hold at any time, but some of them only become usable when attached to or on top of an outfit. The piercer is placed over a use space of a missile or blaster. This use space continues to operate that weaponry, but also now causes shields rolled against it to be reduced by four. 
This ability does stack but cannot reduce a shield below zero. As a reminder, the piercer does have an alternate side which shows the minus four. Each GTS mod or gravitational thrust stabilizer, which is orthogonally adjacent to an engine outfit increases all rolls by that outfit by two. However, no matter how many GTS mods are adjacent to the outfit, it may never exceed its maximum output. As a reminder, the other side of the GTS does show a plus two. Every undamaged M comp mod in a player's hold allows her to carry plus two active missions. If the M comp is ever damaged, the player must discard down to her current available number of active missions. And just as with the other two, the other side does have a plus two to remind the player of what it does. And finally, the Enviro shield, which I believe I failed to show you prior to now, attaches to the use space of a shield like this. This space continues to operate the shield outfit. However, when activated against non-combat damage or energy loss, the shield now automatically operates at maximum capacity. This expansion comes with an official two-player variant which consists of all the same rules as the regular game with two exceptions. For mission target purposes, NPCs count as players with the exception of the Kiln. Also, if the Lone Drifter ability is used, add plus two movement to successful rolls. And that's how you play Zaya Embers of a Forsaken Star. I hope you found this video helpful and educational and hopefully even entertaining. If you did, please consider giving a thumbs up or subscribing to my channel. Also, as I said before, if you want to assist the channel to give any sort of help at all, be sure to uh, check the description below for various ways you can do that. And until next time, if you're bored online, board offline.